probably heard by now. But uh, if to add classes for next semester, you're pretty much hosed. You probably noticed. Um, unless they actually fix something, let's take a look, but that's not likely. Um, last I checked, you could not add classes, at least mine next semester. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the one, we, yeah. And um, I hear a lot of complaints about other ones too, but that's the one I noticed. Yeah, it's the same. That's what I thought. I mean, when we complained, we got an answer that made no sense at all. So uh, this has been the case for the last two or three years. Every time I teach a one unit course, the administration here completely fouls it up so students can't get in. Um, and it looks like they're continuing that tradition here. So I'll have um, ad codes to give people the first day. But if it's like this semester, the ad codes may very well not get you in because they're just unfailingly incompetent. Anyway, um, apparently people are actually getting in some of the other courses here. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah, well, apparently they're like, so maybe it's actually working there. Um, did anybody actually register for one of these courses in the electronic system and have it work? Yeah, I think the only people getting in from some time were people who did it on paper. Anyway, um, all right. So it, it appears to be possible to register for at least some courses next semester. But um, I think the one unit courses are too difficult for them. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at the news. Oh, and there is another guest speaker coming up beyond on Tuesday, a week from, two, no, tomorrow, tomorrow. He'll be here in uh, Science 200 down the hall. So, um, but it will not be live streamed or recorded, so you have to attend it in person because he's giving a version of a talk he gave at DEF CON and it contains something he didn't, he hasn't had cleared through corporate management yet or something like that. So anyway, um, let's take a look at the news. There are a lot of, crazy things going on, including this one, should be good, clean, fun. And um, that's interesting. And yeah, I don't know, maybe that one. All right. Um, Well, I got a few more minutes than I thought, so this one might be actually worth doing. I think I have sound now. Let's see. Um, I go to here. I think sound is available with this high tech system. Let's see if I can play this video. This was a pretty interesting video. Normal computers work at either the power going through a wire or not. If one or a zero, the binary system. Uh, what quantum states allow for is much more complex information to be encoded into a single bit. Regular computer bit is either a one or a zero, on or off. A quantum state can be much more complex than that because as we know, uh, things can be both particle and wave at the same time, and the uncertainty around quantum uh, states uh, allows us to encode more information into a much uh, smaller computer. So now, I, that is actually a very good explanation. He is entirely right. That's very good. I think I might try explaining it more that way. That's very good. Of course, the other half is not so enlightening, but so, anyway. uh, that's what's exciting about quantum computing, and that's what we're um, You know what you're learning is, right? Think of nuclear weapons and other things, like lots of things are done with uranium, including some bad things. Oh, well. He's not wrong either. <laughs> but anyway, um, I liked his explanation of quantum computing. He had it, he had some pretty pretty good explanation. Anyway, so Kubernetes, there was a flaw that came out in February that I was talking about and trying to set up a server to try it. It turned out to be quite difficult to set up. This one here is apparently much worse. It's got like 9.8 out of 10. Um, and but it, it should affect everyone that hasn't updated, but there is no proof of concept code out. I got partway through setting up a target and there's still no official proof of concept out, but it does something like bypass authentication. You connect over the web, it takes the SSH key and you can do things without logging in. So you basically can escalate yourself to administrator and water into people's virtual machines. Kubernetes is an orchestration suite. Um, and this, by the way, I'd say is important. I had a student um, get a job at Cloudflare years ago and I thought he was really smart. He was way past all our classes. 
way ahead of everything we were teaching. And when they hired him, he said, boy, he sure has an awful lot of uh, training on the job to do. He's way behind us. And this was, a bo was bothering me, but it's absolutely true. And Kubernetes is where it's at. People now use containers instead of virtual machines, and they don't you manipulate them one by one. They manipulate them by the thousand with orchestration suites like Chef and Puppet, and Kubernetes is the biggest new one. And so uh, it is, I'm only, I'm only learning the very basics of it, but that's what people are really using. So it is a thing to know. Um, we are not able to keep up with industry, not yet. We're trying, but they are way ahead of us. On the other hand, Kubernetes, this, things change so fast. When I went to Kubernetes, all of the easy install techniques came out like less than a year ago and don't work yet. And this is true of a lot of the stuff I researched. By the time it's already out there, consider the standard already has a vulnerability, there's still no version of it you can actually install and use. Um, so it's uh, kind of madness. Anyway, Amazon's going to have cashierless checkout. They talked about this a while ago. They're going to have cameras and RFID readers that just watch you grab things and put them in your cart. And as soon as you do, they count it towards your bill. Um, so we'll see. This was... They had uh, malware stealing credit card numbers from the only 100 flowers for four years before they noticed it. They just announced that it's about a few California readers, uh, people that got their credit card numbers stolen. I don't know if Canada has breached disclosure laws, so they may not have to disclose it up there. Um, this is in general true. Um, United States switched to chip without PIN cards in order to improve the security over the appalling mag stripe system which is essentially the same as the old system with a piece of rubber and carbon paper that just prints a copy of your number. Um, but something like 100 million cards were compromised in the last year, and that's because even though they are chip cards, merchants continue to use them at the mag strike. So they are, in fact, not getting the benefit of the increased security. Um, so anyway, that uh, they're here to make it sound like it's the merchant's fault, but I believe... Um, the general way credit card companies cause merchants to upgrade is by changing their pricing policy. And what I thought the point was, was they said, this is why they made merchants collect signatures. They said, if you don't collect a signature, you can do that. But if there's fraud, you have to pay for it. We're not paying for it. And so I mean, they certainly can force merchants to upgrade to the chips, but I guess that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I think they did it to whoever, whichever side is, has enabled this. This infrastructure yeah. at the point of sale when there's fraud or theft is not responsible. Well, I think there's a big argument. You know, they made it up a lot by like 2015 to 2016. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea to force you to That's what I thought. There's a reason it's so important. Or maybe somewhat less hostile to human life. Anyway, uh, and I wondered if this would happen. I'm using Zoom right now. Zoom apparently has a critical flaw. And there are proof of concepts out for this from Tenable. But it apparently it has something to do with the software at the Zoom server, and some of that has been updated. But anyway, you can supposedly hack into machines, kick other people out, hack into meetings, kick other people out, and all that jazz. So we may have some action tonight. It'd definitely be worth extra credit if somebody figures out how to hack the Zoom. Um, all right, although it might possibly be illegal or something. The law is pretty much a pesky annoyance. Hackers generally figured this out. All right, um, see what else might be fun. That was, uh, Jake Williams is a uh, security research and publishes a lot of fun stuff. This one I thought is pretty good to use in a talk. So this is uh, time of check, time of use. There you go. There you go. That's how race conditions work. All right, anyway, uh, so the U.S. Senate is apparently not encrypting their hard drives and they're beginning to think they ought to. I said, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> because they're, of course, losing their laptops right and left. And this is pretty amazing. So because of the Chinese trade war, universities are afraid that students will not be able to come here. And so they're buying insurance against the fallen Chinese students because the amount of money paid by foreign students is so large, it pretty much finances colleges. My alma mater, Edinburgh State College, when I went there, was funded largely by Iranian students in the 70s 
that came to America because in the entire nation, the cheapest engineering degree you could get was to go to my college for three years and then Carnegie Mellon for two years and you get an engineering master's or something. And so all the rich Iranians sent their sons over to do that. They got about two years into it. And then we had the Iranian hostage crisis and they all got thrown out. None of them got their degrees. And then the college got sued because it turned out they hadn't really filled out the immigration papers and they were all here illegally. and They were just covering that up to try to collect all the tuition and turned into the typical boondoggle. But anyway, it is certainly the case that um, when, our, when our new, our crooked um, uh, chief, chief technology officer a few years ago moved in, the first thing he did was turn on a fireball to block all Chinese IP addresses. So his professors in China on summer break couldn't access the website. Everyone said, you're crazy. We want Chinese students to enroll here more than anybody because they pay all that high tuition. <laughs> but he thought, oh, we'll just block all that Chinese malware. Anyway, um, which is not entirely stupid, by the way. If you aren't doing business in China, it certainly does make you safer to block the Chinese IP addresses. But we are doing business in China, so it's not such a good idea. Anyway, um, we are. Uh, what's this nonsense? All right. All right. So I should be here. So we're at the last bit of Windows here, and. I think this will do it. All right. So um, we've talked about the registry and other parts of Windows, and now we're down to the last few things, interactive sessions, memory forensics, and persistence mechanisms. There's many, many things in Windows. So I used to teach Windows tech support. It's quite a task. There's a lot going on in Windows. That's why they make so much money. It's the all-purpose answer for every problem. Windows can do practically everything. So uh, if you have an interactive session, that is when you actually go to the machine and type in at the keyboard like this. Typically does not mean you connect over the network, although if you use screen sharing um, then it, or remote desktop or you actually get a graphical environment, then it does interpret it by the computer as an interactive session. Um, there are link files created. Um, every open file, it creates a link file, which is uh, uh, what Linux calls a soft link, I think. I think it's not a hard link. I might have it backwards, but it's a file that is just a shortcut that points to another file. And this goes in your recent files folder. So it can populate documents. And the cool thing about it is it saves all sorts of extra information that you might not think is necessary, which is handy for forensic examiners. It puts it in this recent folder in your username and also in your application data folder. And those things have got the full file path and the network share name and um, the timestamps for the referenced file at the time it was open. So if you change the file later, the shortcut still has the old information, which is extremely useful because the typical scenario is the bad guys deleting stuff, thinking they're hiding the evidence, and you wish you had some kind of historical record. And you do. A bunch of things are not updated and have the record of the way it was before. And um, so you can use these link files to just see what files they accessed and in what order. And often you can just see they went to the secret folder, they ran WinZip to zip them up, they ran something encrypted, they ran something to email it. Here you are committing the crime step by step with your name on every step of it. And you haven't deleted any of that when you delete what you think is the evidence. That's typically what happens. Then there's jump lists. This came out in Windows 7, I think. Microsoft had this thing to imitate basically the Mac where you have all these, instead of having one start button, you have all these other buttons of, of pinned applications down here, and you can right click them, and then it shows you recent things you've opened and things you've pinned that have to do with that application. And so you have a whole bunch of lists to keep track of all that. And those, of course, are also kept keeping track of what you've been doing recently. And um, they're stored in app data, which is a hidden folder in your profile. So it is specific to each user, so we know who was using that file. Um, it's stored in a binary format, so there are various tools to unpack it. But again, you've got a nice list of who's been opening what, when. Then there's the recycle bin, been around for a long, long time. Uh, and this has files deleted from the hard drive. It does not contain files deleted from other volumes all, um, or from the command prompt, but it has the things you've deleted from the desktop and such. All right, and there are tools to go in here and get the metadata out of the recycle bin. One of them is our Reefy UT2. Um, all right, it gets you timestamps out of there so you can see who's been deleting what and when. And then there's memory forensics, which is how we started this class. If you make an image of the RAM, then you've got 
a lot about what the computer is doing. You have all the running processes, network connections, drivers, and you often have passwords in there. One thing I did at Hope maybe six years ago, you just see a lot of plain text passwords right out of RAM from browsers. Although when I tried it about a year ago, the modern browsers seem to have finally updated to where they no longer just store plain text in RAM. At least Chrome doesn't anymore. It used to. You log into a website and your password is just sitting in RAM in plain text which is how Target lost all the credit card numbers. They got hacked through RAM scrapers. Um, they, the bad guys put malware in the system and they just stole the credit card numbers out of RAM from their payment terminals. Um, anyway, uh, you've got portions of the registry in the master file table and you've got console commands up there and a lot of other data structures are in RAM. So there's a physical RAM, which is the actual silicon chips that are fast that store data. And then you've got the page file because um, Computers have the ability to run more code than they have memory for. Now, in the really old days, you would, if you had, you know, 64 megs of RAM, if you tried to open a program and it needed more than 64 meg, it would just not open and give you an error message, not enough memory, go buy a better computer. But what was more cool than that was to invent this paging system. So if you try to use more memory, it will take blocks of RAM and put it on the hard drive in the page file so you can open much more program than you actually have RAM for. Now it will be a thousand times slower because the hard drive is a thousand times slower than the RAM. So when you use up, when you don't have enough RAM, your machine gets really slow. It's really slow to switch between applications because when you switch to an application, it tries to open it, but the data it needs is not in RAM. So it has to grind away and load all that data from the hard drive. But you can have more things open than you have physical memory for. And that's using this page file thing. And the Microsoft operating system is very strange about how it uses the page file. It would seem like if I had four gigs of RAM, I would never use the page file at all unless I actually open a lot of apps that actually use more four than four gigs of RAM. But that is not true at all. Microsoft Windows always uses the page file and it copies stuff to the page file and it even takes stuff out of the page file and puts it back in physical RAM for no apparent reason. It is very strange. And uh, one of the first lessons I got in the more advanced forensics when I taught a class here was when I the students were doing taking my uh, class in the summer, and we had brand new hardware in the hacking lab. And we had brand new machines, and students went in the RAM of those machines, and they found an email that I had written my sister in the lab two years earlier on the previous generation of hardware. And he said, how did they get it? He said, this is a really useful thing to know, because this is why French examiners hate RAM. You find something at RAM, it doesn't prove anything. You have no idea where it came from, who did it, how long ago. What happened is I used to use those computers to do personal things. And apparently that's the that machine I used for that purpose is the one somebody used to make the ghost image to make new machines, which would have got the page file or something off it, which gets copied back in RAM. It's not just one way, like it should be. It is bizarre. You will find things in RAM that have the most bizarre connection to reality. Doesn't mean that somebody has recently been doing that on this machine, not at all. Yeah. Is that uh, page file used on a solid state drive? Yes, they have it too. That's a good point. SSDs don't change it. Uh, they don't change its existence, and I don't think they change how it's used. So Microsoft Windows, in its wisdom, puts things in and out of the page file all the time, even when you're not using all your RAM or even close to it. So you find a lot of strange things in there. And then there's crash dumps. When Windows crashes with the blue screen of death, it creates a dump. Now, the purpose of this is so you can debug what caused the crash. But of course, for 99% of users, they're not going to do that. Now, Microsoft, if you pay for a Microsoft support contract, which a lot of corporate customers do, you can actually take this dump and mail it to Microsoft, and they will figure out what the problem is and send you a patch. But the rest of us, it's just an annoyance. So by default, it dumps only a kernel memory dump that has very little information, but you can adjust it to turn on more of these memory dumps. And so uh, if they've done that, there might be more information in there, even up to the complete memory. But it would not be normal for somebody in a production machine to have it turned on that way. Uh, they're stored here in your local app data. Um, but if all they're storing is the kernel, you're probably not going to find anything very useful in the kernel. Then there's the hibernation files. The hibernation file is intended to let you shut down your machine, preserving all the contents of RAM by popping it all straight to the disk in the Microsoft system without even compression. And it's just sitting there on the, on the hard drive. So that one file is a complete memory image, like you would have gotten with FTK Imager from the point when they, shut, when they powered down the machine. And that's pretty handy, actually. Um, so now they say it's compressed, which that's interesting because it certainly wasn't compressed last time I looked. It was four gigs or four gigs of RAM. I don't know. I know Max, you know, since about three versions ago, Max compressed the real RAM. So you can't use strings to search RAM images anymore. 
As far as I know, there's no free tool that can search RAM images from any version of Mac after about 10.8 or 10.9, which is quite a few versions back now. Um, which, by the way, is a pretty brilliant solution. I think it's got to be a thousand times faster to just zip the RAM than to start using a page file. So I don't know why Microsoft hasn't got the boat yet. I know when Vista came out, the developers of Microsoft said they were going to use RAM on other machines in your local area network to store temporary things rather than the page file, which would make performance better. Everyone said, wow, that's awesome. Other people's data will just come right on my machine where I could steal it. That'll be great. And they didn't actually do that. But I think the developer didn't think of the security implications. Yeah. Oh, you do. But the networks are pretty fast these days. It's 100 megs or gigabit, which is in fact a whole lot faster than writing to the hard drive. That's true. That's true. It's still fast. Well, they thought it would be faster, but it never really happened. There were a bunch of promises in Vista. It didn't really happen. Anyway, um, so volatility can recover this stuff. Uh, you've used it a bit in this class. Volatility is designed to parse memory. So it can actually find the processes and the path, the command line, number of threads, and all that jazz. As you've seen before, you can get a complete print out of the list, but it does have to know exactly which version of Windows you're using, and somebody has to have written a, uh, a template for that version of Windows to uh, find these objects in the RAM dump. All right, so I got some cahoots. Let me get them up here. Um, all right. Favorites. And we are in 152.12c1. That sounds about right. All right. <coughs> Lower that volume some. All right. <laughs> I guess I'll uh, wait a few more seconds. I know, much better than what we used to have. All right. So if you right click a taskbar icon, what are you looking at? All right, those are your jump lists. All right, which one do you get only with live acquisition? That RAM is, you can only get it live. These other things are stored on the hard drive. You can get them by imaging the hard drive. All right, where do you get the entire contents of RAM? Yep, HyperFile has it. All right. And where is the kernel memory? Okay, crash is only the kernel, good. And so I've got Jimmy, which I know who Kaz is. I'm not sure I know who, I know who MDOT is. Jimmy, you may have to tell you, Jimmy. Okay, good, all right. Uh, I can put that here. All right, good. So let's go here. And we're not to an hour yet. We can carry ahead. OK, handles. If you've done any C programming or even Python, you've gotten used to this. You open a file. You have to say f equals f open of a file name. And an f is now the handle to the file. The handle is a pointer to point to a data object. And this applies to files. And in Linux, everything is a file. But in Windows, a lot of things are files, too. So you have devices and other things. 
Uh, there are a lot of these. Now, normally, they're used only internally by one program, but mutexes are the handles which are shared among all applications. So you can make a handle to an object in memory, and then other processes can detect it and refer to that handle. Now, this is where you might be used to share data or to lock a record in a shared object. So it's like, wait a minute, I'm using it. Your other process can't have it until I'm done using it. Um, malware typically does this to mark a machine that's infected. So that when the user runs another copy of the installer to put on another copy of the malware, which is quite common, because if they were dumb enough to open that attachment once, they're probably dumb enough to open the attachment again or something. And um, so it will detect that this machine is already infected and not reinfect it. And therefore, it's very valuable to us because that's an indicator of compromise to tell that that machine is infected. So here, for example, is Zeus. And um, there's a file named Avira, which is a mutant here. So some part of this um, thing, I guess, marked it with a Vera 21.8. And that's right, that's a fingerprint of Zeus, and you notice it makes it look like an antivirus thing. So I guess this is an example of deception, where they choose what looks like an innocent name to mark it. Uh, Zeus is an interesting story of the dysfunction of the crime criminal infrastructure. It was a commercial malware tool, malware creation kit that was sold with license and everything, and then somebody dumped the whole source publicly. I think it might have been the developer had the next version, but anyway, it was made public source on GitHub. Everybody could download it and use it. So it's pretty much uh, blocked by antivirus now, but it's a good way to look at what the real crime where it was. And here's all the handles for Notepad. You can see them in Process Explorer. So there's Notepad, and down here are the various handles for it. So here's one mutant in Notepad. There's something called Mutex Defaults with a long number on it. Uh, legitimate software does use mutexes and handles, of course. Uh, it's Nothing special about them. All right, now each process thinks it's running at 400,000 hex, but it's not really. It's running in different physical RAM, but that's a virtual address. So it has its own virtual address space, including RAM and some hard space in the, in the uh, page file. And the operating system in its wisdom copies things back and forth. So to find that stuff, there's a virtual address descriptor tree, which is what the kernel has to keep track of what memory is actually used by each process. And you can see it in Notepad. If you go into VM map, is another system kernels tool, you can see all the memory segments used by Notepad. If you're taking the exploit development class, we're using immunity to um, view running processes and then attack different segments. And you see a simpler summary of this but uh, every running process has several segments of memory used for different purposes. And they have different permissions, which uh, are not here. It's the protection. Some of them are read, some are read and execute, some are read and write. Um, in the Windows operating system, the security model is write or execute. No module should have both write and execute permissions, and that's to prevent code injection. So you can anything you can write to, which means it could have data that came from the user, cannot be executed. So the user can't be injecting stuff that is then misunderstood and executed. But you, it's not enforced by the operating system. You can make a new section or change the versions of a section to be writable and executable, or you can make it writable and write to it and then make it executable and execute it. So it's not perfect, but in general, that does prevent uh, most simple attacks. Yeah? Can't you just like change um, appendix, like put it into EXE? Oh, the extension? Um, no, because that, that's a different issue. That's the file itself, whether it's actually good or not, which, uh, which is a permission issue. Um, the only thing the extension does is tell you the default application to launch it with. But even an EXE does not have a section when it's running. Like, this is an EXE. This is Notepad. An EXE is running, but there is no memory section that is both writable and executable. The part that's executing is not changing. <laughs> right. Same, it'd be the same thing for BAT or anything else. Um, unless uh, um, someone has done something malicious here, the default handling doesn't let you have write and execute on the same check. That's the idea. Anyway, and then you see the DILs. Of course, every application uses a lot of libraries. This makes Microsoft software smaller, faster, and more portable. So Notepad doesn't bother writing a whole bunch of things like support for foreign languages and graphics and dialogues, like to open that file open and file save box. All that stuff is just coming in from DILs, and you can see all the DILs it's using. And most of the time when malware takes over your machine, it tricks a process into loading an extra DIL it doesn't need and puts the malware in the DIL. That's the most common way to do it. So you can try to find out which DILs are malicious. And so you can look for ones that are not signed or ones that have invalid signatures. That would be a clue, although unfortunately not everything is signed with valid signatures. 
Um, you can look for known bad hash values, which is malware identified by somebody like virus total, or known good hash values. We have plenty of libraries that have all the known innocent files. So you can include them from analysis. Or you can look for evidence that something bad has happened here. Like if the image in memory is different than the image on the disk, that implies that something weird has happened here. All right, and so you got network connections, which you wanna see in running and drivers. And you've got a, a strings and credentials in RAM. These are all things you might look for. Uh, your page file is just an image of RAM and you doesn't have any real structure at all. What it is is blocks of memory I think four kilobytes or four megabytes at a time, just pages, they call them. And uh, there's no particular structure to it. Uh, but, all right. Anyway, but one thing that's annoying is your antivirus product, of course, contains every antivirus signature, every malware signature, and it puts it in the code of that product. And that can get copied to the page file. And now when you're searching through it, you'll find malware. This one example of this was um, in a, uh, the teacher in Washington State was accused of viewing pornography in class, which apparently is a real issue, and they really get prosecuted for this. And so um, they analyzed his machine, and they found a bunch of porn site URLs. In it. We tried to prosecute him for going there, but it turned out to be his anti-malware product, and that was the blacklist of URLs to block. So, I mean, the URLs of forbidden sites are on your machine, and that does not mean you've been visiting those URLs. It could very well mean you have some kind of security product which contains that data. So it's not enough to just find a string on the page file or in RAM and then accuse somebody of something. As I was saying before, something could be in RAM and not mean what you think it does at all. That's why for a long time, hard examiners wouldn't even, uh, forensic examiners would not even look at RAM. They'd say, just kick out the plug, turn off the computer. The only thing that matters is the hard drive because on the hard drive, files have owners and date stamps. So I can tell who did what and when. And in RAM, you can't prove anything. But in incident response, you do care about RAM because you don't necessarily need to attribute everything with a timestamp. You just need to find out what's going on. Anyway, um, and of course, even criminal forensics uses RAM too now. You just have to be more careful. It's really, we just have to get off our high horse and admit we're no different than people look at blood spatters or fingerprints. You know, if you find a fingerprint on something, it doesn't come with a timestamp either. So you don't know if that was today or last week or last year, and yet you don't just not bother and say it's useless. You say, well, it is evidence, and we just have to understand what it proves and use it as part of other evidence to build our pace. And the same thing's true of stuff you find in RAM. Yeah. That's a very good question. Is there a fingerprint for computers? People have argued about this. Now, um, in general, all the bit torrenters of the world are relying on the fact that there isn't. And they can download a copyrighted movie and nobody can figure out who they are. And the whole movie industry is trying to find a way to fingerprint your computers. Now, what they typically do is they take the IP address, which is all they have, and they try to prosecute you from the IP address. But the IP address is not really tied to your machine at all. If you move to a different coffee house or even just restart it, you might get a different IP address. What they really like is the MAC address, but the MAC address doesn't leave your local place. This is why people can do things like go behind tour. So there's a whole big industry of trying to fingerprint your device. This is why Sony tried putting rootkits on your device so they could put a special mark on your device and tell if you copied music. This is why the FBI attacked the pedophiles on tour by putting malware on the pedophile site that they would download. It said, it put a warning saying you have to download a new version of the browser and they put malware in the browser. So that machine would then phone home and tell the cops who they are. So I mean, it's, it's a very hard issue to tell who's doing what and there's a lot of work into it. Yeah. If someone's downloading what? Movie. Yeah, what about it? But they can track you if you're downloading well, so that's an issue of how they can track you if you're downloading movies. Now, a lot of people use um, encrypted transmissions these days, but the typical way they do it is they hire a company. I used to know a name, but I've forgotten. There's a company that the recording industry hires to catch people downloading music, and what they do is they put up the BitTorrent seeds. If you download movies, something like 5% of the connections you're making are to the Recording Industry Association, so you're downloading from their server, and they have a log of it. That's how they know. That's why experienced BitTorrenters download special blacklists of known um, sites that are tracking you and don't use them, just like people put radar detectors in their car to try to find the cops and speed when the cops aren't around. It's... um. That's why one thing, I also knew some friends that did this, they'd form like a, they'd join like a club of maybe 10 people and they would share files only inside their club. 
So as long as nobody in the club is a crook, they can share movies among just 10 of them and they won't get caught or so they imagine. Anyway, it's, um, it is a big issue. And uh, Putin said several years ago that he thinks the cure for the internet problems is to just end internet anonymity. Every machine should be required to have a unique ID and you should be required to put that ID on everything you do, every social media post, every email, every purchase, and then we'll get rid of all this misbehavior. And he's probably right about that. You would get rid of all that misbehavior. We haven't gone for that yet in America, but that certainly is one option. Uh, yeah. Well, right now, uh, you know, what you did before or anything interesting? Yeah. They actually start voting here. They actually what? If you're doing anything interesting, yeah. they know that you're doing something. Oh, that's true. If you are using Tor, people can easily see that you are using Tor and that you're encrypting your traffic. And of course, there's the dirty little secret, which is Tor is the U.S. military. Most of the servers in Tor are, in fact, U.S. military servers run by the NSA and other government agencies. It's a U.S. military product. It was developed by the Navy, and then you got adopted by the NSA so that spies in foreign countries could send data back. And they said, you know, because of what he just said, we can't just have our spies being the only ones using it because people will see them sending encrypted stuff and they'll be suspicious. So what we need is a bunch of idiots downloading porn through it for the spies to hide among. So they open sourced it and let it become perceived as an anti-government privacy solution. So all the idiots in the world would download stuff and think they're hiding from the government, but in fact, they're just handing it right to the government. And now the spies have a bunch of cover hiding in among those guys to send their secret messages back. And you can't tell it from the thousand people downloading malware and porn through it. So anyway, it's um, every three years or so, the Tor community discovers that it's all a US military project and freaks out and publishes a lot of scary things. And then they forget it again. Um, it's It's, a curious psychological thing. Anyway, so there's things you can do in memory, like process injection and hooking. Um, process injection is where you change the code of a running process, which is another kind of crazy thing to do. So you're running something innocent like Notepad, and I'd like you to run malware instead. So all I do is rip out the code in Notepad and replace it with different code, and it keeps running with the same permissions, only it's running a malicious process now. Um, you can inject code with a DIL library is the most common way. You can also replace the executable code there with custom code. Um, and the injected process has no evidence showing which process did that. You can do this with the Windows API. There's an API call to tell a program to load a DIL because the point of Windows software is you can dynamically load memory. You can be running a program and you can click an option and say, oh, I need another library for that. I'll just grab that library. This is a desirable feature. This means the program doesn't have to load everything right at once. So it can load faster and run a smaller memory footprint unless you turn on the memory intensive application. So Microsoft does this for a good reason, but it also is handy for the bad guys, which is generally the case. Any full featured convenient thing usually has a bunch of extra open doors for bad guys. Um, and then there's process replacement you can load a process and some process is, can be suspended while you replace all the code and resume them and now they're running totally different code. This is more work for the bad guys because it's easier to write a DIL that will do bad things than to write something that can, can operate in this fashion, but both are possible. And Redline can supposedly detect this uh, when I tried Redline Mandian product, which I haven't had but good luck with, occasionally it detects something. Most of the time it just takes forever and detects nothing. Um, so again, you can look for memory sections with both um, read with write and execute on the same section. That should not happen normally. And if it does, that means something's wrong. Or you can look for the contents of memory to not equal the disk file. And that also indicates that something is wrong. Because what, when you launch a program, you're just supposed to copy the exe from disk into RAM and run it there. Yeah? Clearing the memory. What's that? Clearing the memory. Yeah. Clearing the memory. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure about clearing memory. Deleting cookies, you mean? Well, there is. I don't know what clearing memory is. I know what deleting cookies is. Oh, the cache. Oh, the cache. Yeah, the cache is on hard drive, like the cookies. Uh, well, it, it clears the, it deletes the files that are in the cache. But now they're in recycle bin. And it does not clear the sectors. So no, it, by itself, it doesn't do much. It's no different than deleting any other files. It gets them out of the way to make room for new files, but it does not really remove the evidence. The only thing that would... The, emptying the trash can also does not remove the evidence. All it does is mark that space available for reuse. 
The only thing that would delete the evidence is to have a forensic erasing program. Like you can download one called Eraser or another one called Steganography, but no, but there's no built-in activity that will do it on a file-by-file -file basis. The only thing you can do is open a command prompt and use FDisk clean all to erase the entire disk. But yeah, this is, if you install Steganography, you can set it to always forensically erase everything. And then it will make your machine slower but it will not leave all these traces behind. If you're using a modern machine with SSDs, it has an automatic background process to delete large blocks of unused stuff, and that tends to delete everything. So the amount of leftover data from deleted files is much smaller on SSDs than hard drives, but that's only true if you have the latest model of SSD, the latest operating system, and the right driver. Uh, when I trusted it about four years ago, it was about half the machines that actually had garbage collection working. The other half didn't, and were the same as hard drives. These days, it might be more. But I know if you have a Mac with the built-in machine, built-in SSD, it does this. But I think if you put it on a third-party SSD, it probably won't. So, you know, it's, but it's, when this first was discovered about six years ago, there's a famous paper that came out and said this would be the end of forensics. There won't be any leftover data on the disk. And it hasn't been quite that bad, but it does mean that there's less leftover data from deleted files. Of course, the other thing I think that really ended that is, um, cloud. Now you put yourself in the cloud. I cannot get a, an exact copy of the hard drive up in the cloud. All I get is the active data. So I'm not getting the deleted files, but still there's plenty of evidence of things even without the deleted files. Anyway, so then there's persistent mechanisms. If you want to survive after reboot your malware, you're going to have to relaunch the malware when you reboot the machine. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Auto run keys and so on. Um, so hooking is another trick. You can put a hook in the operating system, and this is a um, piece of code that is connected sort of like to an interrupt. An interrupt is a similar process, where every time certain activities take place, it will say, wait, there's a hook. Before you do that, you have to go to this other thing. This is what you might have to do because you have a different keyboard, and it has to do a different code to run the keyboard, and it's what you use for keyloggers. And antivirus does the same thing. You trouble click on a file to launch it, and your antivirus hook says, wait, before you open that file, I have to scan it first. It's all done with hooking. You'd also do this for inventory software, where you might have to record that this application has been used against my software license, so I have to record how many people have been using this software this month to see if I have to pay for a bigger license. It's another thing you might do with hooking. So malicious hooking, you can hook this to hide files, processes, um, network connections, because you can say if someone is running, say, directory, well, before you run directory, let me go find, decide what to let you see and what to hide from you. So I put a hook in there to get in between you and the file system so your directory will not include the hidden files and so on. And key loggers, of course, are the obvious case of this, where every time you press a key, we will hook the process that handles a keystroke and do something extra recorded in the key logs log. So you can do this a lot of ways. The process in the... Um, Portable executable file, at the header, there is an import address table. This lists the functions to import from the dills. You saw those dills in Notepad, and there'll be header lines in the Notepad header saying, I need this function from that library, this function from that library, and that will tell the operating system what libraries to load when I load Notepad. So I can do that. You could modify it to load malicious dills instead, and now it's loading different things. Um, you could also hook kernel structures. We do this in, I think, the 126 class. We hook the SSDT. Um, the SSDT is a table of pointers to kernel routines. Every kernel routine is in that table. Uh, this is a general case, and it's been this way all the way back, I know, to the Commodore VIC-20, probably before that. You never directly call system routines by address because the operating system has certain functions, and if you were to jump directly to the address where that function starts, then if they put a patch or an update on the operating system, your code would quit running. And nobody wants that. So what they do is you have a lookup table. You jump to a certain address in a lookup table, and that calls a system routine, like allocate memory, read a file from the disk, and all the other many um, API calls you need to make. And if I update the operating system, I change the location of the, the code, and then I update the table to point to the new location. So your program can continue to go to the same place and get the same response, even though I've updated the operating system. This is necessary, otherwise you would go nuts. You'd, now there are some versions of Linux. I've heard that Slackware works this way, and I think Arch, where every time you install an application, you have to recompile the kernel, because it doesn't have this kind of decoupling of processes. And that's what you'd have, and that's probably what you should have for things like an Internet of Things device where you're going to have some little gadget, you want it to be as small and as cheap as possible and use the minimum power and hard disk space, so you would not want the extra overhead of making the decoupling. 
But generally, for a general purpose computer, you do want this decoupling. So I can just keep installing more patches and versions of everything in software and more patches and versions of everything in the operating system. The two of them will continue to work together. So that's the point. But it does mean that there's a point of attack in this table. If I can change the address of a system routine in that table, every time any program tries to call a system routine, it'll call something else. So I could hijack an important call, like the thing that reads a file on the disk, and I could put in a special code to ignore files that start with a certain character, and now I could hide malicious things there, and you would never see them. I mean, every file open dialog would not let you see them. And that's what uh, rootkits do, among other things. So Microsoft has kernel patch protection to try to prevent this. This was very popular up till around 2008. On almost every security product worked this way, by hooking in, and Microsoft got pretty fed up with it, and they made it more and more difficult to do it this way, because it really does kind of subvert the uh, fundamental heart of the operating system and can lead to problems, and that's what happened to Sony. Sony put out a rootkit to mark your machine with techniques like this, and it turned out that they did it wrong, and the rootkit had bugs, and it opened your machine to malware, and there was no way to take it off, and they had a huge lawsuit from that. Many times, legitimate products have imitated malware and usually come to regret it, because, of course, the malware doesn't really mind collateral damage, but legitimate products can't really have a lot of collateral damage. Anyway, so Zeus, here's the hooks of volatility plugin showing a machine infected with Zeus. And so it's going to show you the HTTP send request is hooked. So let's see if we can understand that here. Here's HTTP send request, and there's the hook address. The real thing is here. It's 771C, but the hook goes off to A27. And when you do it in the 126 class, you can see it. All the um, real kernel routines all point to the same address area because the kernel is really pretty small. And all the hooks stick out like a sore thumb, jumping to some random address that's totally wrong. And that's why it's really not that hard for Microsoft to put in a defense. And modern versions of Windows supposedly have a defense to detect this. So if you're going to analyze your memory, you need a tool to acquire the memory, and then you need a tool to analyze the image you collect. We did it in this class with FTK Imager. There are plenty of other tools that can image the memory. If you just open HXD, you can just open the physical memory right there and view it. There's a lot of things you can view the memory. And once you've got it, then you need a tool to analyze it because it does not come with a master file table and file names and timestamps like the hard disk. So let's try another Kahoot. And see if I can get my junk visible. Leave page. All right. There's this one and there's another one. I think I just forgot to make it a favorite. All right. I think we got 10 last time. I'll wait a few little while to see if we get up to 10 again. Mm -hmm. I'll give it about five more seconds. All right, I guess that's it. All right. The kernel structure that shows how memory is used. The virtual address descriptor. All right. Which one will include malware signatures even when you don't have any malware? Page file? All right. Which one of these is most likely to be malicious activity? Injection is bad. All the rest of those are routine system activities. All right. And which one is something malware uses to prevent reinfection? Okay, those are mutants. All right. And so I'll uh, 
it's 10 minutes to seven. We might as well take, yeah, let's, so let's take a break till seven. I'm going to pause the recording. I'll, re, or, um, I'll leave the share going so more people can see. But,